This is David Marler, UFO researcher, and you're listening to That UFO Podcast. Uh, so let's start off with a question from Gary. And Gary asks, Terry, do you have a gut feeling on whether the humans you saw working alongside the aliens during your abduction were raised on Earth or were they elsewhere? And I'm guessing by that he means hybrids or from somewhere else. These seven, eight maybe people were young people. They were my age. They were 18, 19, 20 in that uh, age range. And they were... uh, uh, tan colored flight suits. And I, I don't know anyone, it certainly wasn't in our Air Force, I don't know anyone that was wearing uh, tan colored flight suits. And they weren't right next to us, they were a little bit of a, away. Um, but, and I couldn't move except my eyes, I could look with my eyes. And what I noticed was that they had, their combat boots were identical to mine. They look like government issue combat boots. Um, so I think these, I think these, I think these people were crew members in some capacity. And I think that, you know, the reason they're there is maybe we, being the humanity, the government, works in concert with ET, at least on some level. Um, you know, the, these people would never didn't didn't turn to look at us. They made they made it a point just to absolutely ignore us. Um, and they had to see me. They had to see us standing there. And um, I don't know. I think that they were human beings, and I think that they were crew crewmen. Um, but of course, that's just a guess, and that's mostly based on the fact that they were wearing what I saw and perceived to be, you know standard issue combat boots. The tan flight suit, I have no idea. They also had an orange patch, um, but I was too far away to see the writing on it. I I wish I could have. Um, And the front of the uniform didn't have the name tag or any other insignia of rank or anything. I didn't see anything like that. It's a theory. It's a theory that comes across quite often that the, for whatever reason, the triangular objects tend to be a cross of our technology, reverse engineered, mixed in with something else's technology. So it would make sense if that is the case. That, and it's it's far fetched, but isn't the whole subject that maybe we could be mixing crews. Maybe there is some kind of technology exchange, some kind of knowledge exchange that goes along with that as well. So it's, it's certainly a very interesting idea that, you know, close encounters of the third kind type idea that we're sharing, you know, our own humans and scientists and military personnel and passing them off to another civilization that we may be in contact with. Um, we're going to come back to that, though, and, and some of the other questions, I think, as well. Move on to a question from Sarah. Sarah has two questions. She asks, since sharing his experience, has Terry been approached or contacted by any three-letter agencies akin to when he was in the hospital after his abduction occurred? Yeah, um, I had this gentleman from the Department of Defense knock on my door and give me an apology. I also got a phone call from Tom DeLong. Uh, who's a musician with the band One Blink One Eighty Two? Maybe familiar. Um, uh, I'm wearing one of his hoodies just now um, from his company, so I've got, I've got one of Tom's hoodies on. And, and and you know Tom DeLong is a is a musician, but he got involved in the UFO community uh, for some reason and had some uh, very credentialed, very reputable people leave government service to work for him and his organization they call To The Stars Academy. And uh, I, I, my phone rang one day and I, I looked, this is in 2018, maybe 60 days after my book went, went up on Amazon for sale. And I looked down at my phone and it's it just says LA uh, and a number. And, you know, I know people in California and in LA and uh, well, who, who is this? And uh, uh, I said, hi, this is Terry. And the voice on the other end said, Terry, it's Tom DeLong. How are you? 
I didn't know who he was. <laughs> and, uh, but I didn't want to tell him that. I said, I'm, I'm great, Tom. How are you? And he said, I'm, I couldn't be better. I'm here with uh, General McArdle, uh, Lou Elizondo, uh, and I think there was a third person that was in on this call. Um, and he wanted to know if uh, Lou Elizondo could come to my house and uh, talk to me about my story. I said, sure. Yeah, come on, come on down. Um, and he did. Lou Elizondo came to my house. Um, we spent a day together. Uh, he and he had a cameraman there that, that filmed me telling what happened, telling my story. And uh, uh, at the end of it, we went out and, uh, and uh, had, a, had a nice meal and, and he took off. What's interesting was uh, at the time, I was being harassed by flying by helicopters. Mm. And this is, I, I don't, I'm not sure I've ever told this story on the air, but uh, from about mid 2018 to early 2019, uh, at the home where we lived, I had this big oak tree on the left side of my front yard, and the sunrise would come up on the right. So really my field of view was kind of limited to the backyard and over the top of my house, unless I walked out, you know, to the street. Yeah. And we started hearing this helicopters. I mean, and they buzzed our house. They flew around our house, you know, did, did circles. And uh, I took photographs of them. And uh, I, I have one photograph where I have a helicopter and then I had to blow these up. They were just specks on my camera. And when I blew them up, there's also a saucer. So pretty cool. I don't know if the saucer's chasing the helicopter or the helicopter's chasing the saucer. Um, I have a friend. Uh, he's a history professor um, at Citrus University in, in uh well, near LA, uh, his name is uh, uh, Bruce Solheim, and he uh, he's interested in this topic, uh, and he was a helicopter pilot in the army, and I sent him photographs of all of these uh, helicopters, and he calls me up and he says, "Well, a couple of things," he says, "You know." They're, they all should display an N number. That is the alphabetical character N, like a Nancy, followed by a string of numbers that identifies that particular helicopter. And none of these had any kind of markings whatsoever. Uh, I didn't see, you know, the United States Air Force. I didn't see there, there were no markings on them. In fact, there were two, there were four kinds of helicopters. Two of them were civilian commercial helicopters you or I could go out and buy. Hmm. Um, and they were a Robertson R-22 and a Robertson R-44. The 44 was a little bigger. I think it sat like four or five people where the 22 was a smaller helicopter, two people usually. And he wanted to know, you know, can you see what kind of helmets they're wearing? Or are they wearing helmets? And I said, yeah, I, I've got photographs. They're all wearing a white, a white helmet. And he says, well, here's the way it works. Helicopter pilots in the commercial industry refuse to wear helmets. They won't wear them because the helmet obscures their vision from the side and they want a clear view of the sky. And uh, they'll assume that risk, you know, of a head injury because they think it's safer. So the fact that these guys were wearing white helmets, Bruce said that that's an indication these were military people. So then I went and, uh, you know, being a lawyer, I went and, and looked at the law and there, there are regs by the, that control the Federal Aviation Administration. And I found under the United States Code, um, the law 
that dictates what helicopters can do and can't do. And, um, and in that, they state plainly that, you know, every helicopter must display uh, identifiers, you know, that alphabetical symbol M followed by a string of digits. And it said all what they could be. And I read this and I thought, hmm, you know, I maybe there's a, a, an ex exclusion, uh, you know, a uh, um, everybody has to display that except for these people who aren't. And it, the answer was military. Don't have to put that on their helicopters. And I thought this was interesting. Certain government agencies. And that's all. It's a pretty broad. Um, but I'm assuming it means, you know, the three letter agencies, which, which there's dozens. Mm. It's a story that must have come up in a different interview because um, one of the questions that came up next was from Christian and he asks, in a previous interview, you've spoken about black helicopters harassing or surveilling you. But he asks, Terry, when Lou Elizondo came to see you, they seemed to stop. Do you think they stopped after Elizondo's visit because of him or do you think that may be coincidence? I think they stopped because this is an interesting story. I'm glad that he asked this question. Uh, yeah, I mentioned the two Robertson uh, R-22s and R-44s. The other two helicopters were, were military helicopters. Uh, one made one was an Airbus 350, and the other was just a generic military helicopter. I don't remember the designation, but those two two were military, two were civilian, and uh, yeah, the uh, the Robertson helicopters were, were black. Um, the military helicopters that I saw were all um, all green. They were all they were both green. And um, when Lou came to see me, that's one of the things he wanted to see. He wanted to see the helicopters. And I said, "Well, you know, they're normally here between uh, eight and ten a.m. So, uh, you know." come over in the morning. Uh, and of course he came over and there were no helicopters, but we went to dinner that night. We went to a Mexican restaurant and Lou is, his ancestry is, he's Cuban. Mm. Um, so he liked the food. It was, it was similar to what he grew up with. And, uh, uh, we had a nice meal. Uh, it was Lou and his cameraman, me and a friend. And we had a great meal, great conversation. And I'm walking him out to his car. Um, we're all kind of in a little group. And uh, he's in a, a black suburban. And his cameraman was about to put a key in the door or open the door to the car. And a large, I mean a large military helicopter. We heard it before we saw it flew over us by maybe 110 feet doing like, I don't know, hundred miles an hour or something. It was just whoosh. And uh, it, it was a great ending because Lou didn't see one at my house, but at the restaurant, he saw one uh, go up the street and he, he just kind of looked at me and went, um, because uh I can't think of any other reason why a uh, helicopter would have been flying over Garland, Texas. You know, but, For what reason, though, you think if you were going to surveil someone and you are a government agency, shadowy figures in the background, no doubt quite a deep black budget, uh, helicopters aren't the most conspicuous way, black or not, to, to do that. What, why do you think that is? Why well, to me it they wanted me to know they're there. That's what I think. Intimidation. Uh, yeah, that's yeah, they did you know I'm sure they could covertly surveil me in any number of ways. Um is um have you heard the, the term uh targeted individual? Hmm. 
um, someone, if not Lou, but someone else affiliated with Tom DeLong's To the Stars Academy, um, a physician who actually came down to see me too and x-rayed my leg and we talked for a long time. And he told me, he says, I think you are a targeted individual. And that means that for whatever reason, um, they're, you're, you're on their radar and they follow, they're going to follow you through your life. And rarely ever does a year go by that I don't see crazy UFO in the sky. Um, it just, it happens. And I mean, I see something silver dart across the sky and reach for my phone. And of course, by the time I get it and raise it to my eye, it's long gone. Uh, or I see something static sitting on the horizon. Uh, and the thought to use my phone never crosses my mind. I don't get that. But again, I think that speaks to the, the level of influence that these things have. So. I can understand that. I'll go back to Sarah's second question. And Sarah asks, has Terry experienced any strange synchronicities post-abduction? Perhaps lucid dreams that could glean more details on his abduction experience? Yeah, I think, and I, I think what Sarah, and correct me if I'm wrong, I do, do I experience synchronicities that I think could be related to this incident? And uh, potentially a consequence of the incident, you know, seeing more synchronicities post abduction, um, and also again, or perhaps lucid dreams that could glean more detail. So, do you think you do have any particularly intense dreams that may be sort of flashbacks of the abduction itself? I do, I do, and I, in the process of writing this book, I had some nightmares that recurred, uh, that were familiar, but I hadn't, hadn't seen them in a long time. But I feel that uh, when I wrote this book and had the intent, maybe they could read my intention. My intention was to publish it and talk about it. Um, I, had some, I had some odd things happen. And not after after the event itself in 1977, I didn't notice synchronicity. I didn't notice uh, what I call heightened intuition. But shortly after I wrote the book, my life was a little different in that I suddenly had, I won't say that I'm psychic by any stretch of the imagination, but I, I think my intuition is, you know, through the roof. Uh, I'll give you an example. I, I went and bought some bird seed. Uh, recently. And the lady said, I'm out and they were busy. I'm, I'm out of uh, nickels. I got to give you six pennies. And no worries. I don't care. So she gave me, gave me my change on a couple, couple bills. And as soon as the, as soon as the uh, change hit my hand in my mind's eye, I knew that there was a wheat penny a penny that they hadn't made since prior to 1959. Um, the, the pennies that we have in circulation now all have a, uh, the Lincoln Monument on the, on the reverse side. Um, but they used to have two sheaves of wheat on either side and it just said one cent. And uh, I didn't have time to look because they were busy and I put the change in my pocket and I drove home and I pulled it out of my pocket. And sure enough, there's a 1956 penny in my pocket. And I just thought that was odd. It was odd because I knew it. Um, and I had a couple small things like that. Uh, again, I don't, I don't think I'm psychic. Uh, I think that I just call it heightened intuition. And I think a lot of people that have, a close experience with them come away with something like this. Uh, I had people write to me and refer to it as a gift. Um, maybe, I don't know. Um, I don't know. 
No, I can appreciate that. Um, I've got a few questions sent in from Dave Smethurst. Dave's a, a good friend. Met him a few times face to face, and uh, it's been a while since I've had a few questions from him, Terry. So uh, feel privileged that Dave sent in so many questions for you. He's a busy man himself. So thanks, Dave. Um, first off, um, Dave wants to know what did Terry think of David Grush's revelations in 2023 and how they related to your own experience. Um, asking did it give you some more clarity what further questions do you have after listening to David Grush so of course referring to David Grush talking about the US government having crashed saucers crashed craft and recovered biologics of non-human origin alien bodies well hi David that's a great question I I, I can tell you uh, that I watched that hearing three times from beginning to end um, and paid close attention. And it wasn't just David Grush. It was David Grush and uh, two pilots. One was an active duty Navy pilot. The other was a former Navy, uh, former military pilot but who flew commercial aircraft now. And the, all three of them had input. Um, what do I think about David Grush? I think I think he's a very, very credible man. I, I, I don't think somebody uh, with a decent career and a family would endanger that by making that up, making this up. It doesn't make sense. Um, I know that I heard through channels, and I believe it's true, that they revoked his security clearance when he first came out and, and spoke about this because uh, he has a lawsuit against the government through mm -hmm. the inspector general's office. Um, and at some point they reinstated all of his uh, security clearances. So he now has everything back that they took from him. I have also heard that there are 17, that's the number specifically that they told me, there are 17 uh, witnesses, whistleblowers, that want to come forward and speak about what they saw themselves. So the, the big criticism that David Grush got was that he personally did not see any of this. He was just reporting what other people had told him. So, I mean, it's, it's hearsay. I understand, I understand their objection to that. So they've lined up 17 people that uh, I hope, you know, there was a hearing in the House of Representatives today that was supposed to address these issues. And I just hope that they had some input from those 17 people. Um, I know as we record this, there was the skiff that had the congressmen and women reading over David Grush's claims. Uh, just a few hours ago, I spoke to Congressman Tim Burchett, who, who confirmed that everyone came out of it, Democrat and Republican, saying the same thing, that they, they largely believe David Grush is the real deal and what he's saying is legitimate. So at the very least today, they've, got, they've been pointed in the right direction as to, I think Tim Burchett said to me, as to who to go after to pull into hearings, um, individuals, no doubt, working for private aerospace companies, people like you say, Terry, who are, are looking to come forward to talk about this. And I think even, and I, I might be getting this, I, I think I'm correct, David Grush, when you go back to his original hearing, never actually said he didn't have any first-hand accounts um, his language was something along the lines of, I can't discuss first-hand knowledge at this time, but it seems that he does now have a clearance, like you say, and it's been cleared through Dopser to discuss that potentially going forward in a manner. I know that was something people accused him of changing his story of. I went back at the time and checked the hearing, and he didn't actually say he didn't have first-hand. He's very careful to say, I can't talk about that at this time. So, yeah, it would make sense, those clearances coming back. He's re getting things reviewed. I'm no expert on the system, but it, it checks out that, you know, he's a very clever individual. He knows what he's saying. He yes. knows what he's not saying, and he's quite deliberate in the words and language that he uses. So that um, 
that all that all stems very good. Um, Dave also followed up here, uh, and something similar to what I asked you earlier, Terry. Do you feel a sense of vindication in terms of the negative comments you have received from some people uh, when you hear someone like David Grush coming out and saying what he says? Yeah, I think it is vindication. Uh, you know, I think that there are a lot of people like me who are going to say, you know, hey, I told you so. You know, they're real. Uh, you know, I've never gotten, fortunately, I've never had uh, a real big pushback from people saying, ah, your story's just, you know, BS, you made this up to sell books. Or I've never had any of that. Uh, I don't know. I guess I'm fortunate for that because I was expecting that. I was worried that uh, I don't know why I was worried. I, you know, I retired. I don't care what my uh, peers have to say anymore from the legal community. Uh, but I was surprised that uh, I had a few con contact me and say, I believe every word of it. You know, it, I, I'm glad that you are being candid and telling the public about this. Um, and then I had just a couple people say, have, you know, have you lost your mind? What is wrong with you? Uh, so, yeah, I don't know. It's, it's vindication. Uh, Let me follow up on that with you, Terry. So as someone who has experienced what you've experienced and been through what you've been through, if tomorrow President Biden, 3 p.m. address, White House lawn, okay, we're coming clean. Uh, I found out we do have recovered alien bodies. We do have recovered craft. We have been in contact with species who aren't human. What would you personally want done next? Because everyone's going to have a different take on how that affects their lives. You've had a more personal experience than others. So what, what would you want done next with that knowledge? Well, first of all, let me say that if Biden did that, I know what would not happen. And that is th there wouldn't be uh, panic. There wouldn't be riots in Hong Kong and New York City and people screaming. And I don't think there's anything like that because I think that if Biden were to do that, I think there'd be a solid 20% of the people that hear it that just will refuse to believe it. I remember in 1969 when people landed on the moon for the first time, uh, I read the St. Louis Globe Democrat. You know, I was in eighth grade, I think, and uh, I read the news every morning and there was a uh, poll and I forget the, the polling company. Um, it may have been Pew, P-E-W, uh, that does statistically valid uh, uh, studies on, on all kinds of things. And, they, you know, they made a thousand telephone calls to people randomly to ask what their mm -hmm. opinion was and 20 percent of the people that they called said ah that never happened they filmed that in arizona in the desert so i think kind of the same thing's going to happen with uh it'll take a generation for the stigma to completely be gone and it'll take a generation for people to eventually accept this. Um, so, what about for you? What, what would you, what would you want from it? What would I want? Uh, I I would love for Biden to do that. But but if he did, I, I want again. I'm I'm trying to put myself in your shoes. I've I've had a sighting. But you've you've had um, ridicule, you've had intimidation, you've had you know what you went through in the military. You know you lost a friendship and a close friend through it. Uh, you had a, an experience you didn't ask for. You were physically harmed. So you, you find out and you get that confirmation. Are you looking for more answers? Would you be looking for you know a, a military compensation, which I think a lot of pilots and military personnel would be entitled to who have had injuries over the years and the decades and been largely dismissed due to this phenomenon, what, what would you be looking for personally that would kind of help you gain some form of closure or, or would that confirmation be enough? Confirmation would pretty much do it for me. I had an apology and, uh, 
I, I, you know, I'm not looking to profit from this. I'm not looking to, uh, to sue someone. I mean, that's what lawyers do. I mean, I kind of wired that way, but I don't, uh, I don't, I don't see the benefit to that. Um, other people can do that, but, uh, I'll just be, you know, I think that day is going to come. It may not be Biden on the White House lawn, but it'll be something similar. That day is going to come. And uh, it'll be interesting to see what happens. Um, as a lawyer, I'm presuming you were following the UAP Disclosure Act or the Schumer Rounds Amendment that was part of yeah. the NDAA. And um, Dave asks, and I would have had this one in here, I'm sure Dave would understand that, but I've let Dave ask it. Do you think that was a good idea in terms of the way forward for transparency? I think the two big key, key call-outs in that were the eminent domain, which was obviously permission for the government to claim any and all materials of non-human origin, no matter who had them, and pull them back into their ownership whether that be a private aerospace contractor or someone like Jacques Vallier, Gary Nolan, who would suddenly lose any materials they were studying. And the other aspect was the Presidential Review Board, which was the nine-person study or panel that would be set up to help disclose. What did you think of the whole situation? Wow, that's a big question. Um, you know, I'd like to see a government panel. You know, they did the Connor Report or something years and years ago. But I'd like to see something similar to the, um, oh, I forget the name of it. They did, an, um, they did an investigation of the Kennedy assassination, and that mm. was very well done. I forget the name of the study, but uh, I'd like to see something done at that level. Uh, Schumer, uh, you know, a Democrat, uh, and, and his buddy Rhodes, uh, I think had the best intention and I, I think that uh, they knew on some level that uh, just given the mathematics of the, of the way people will, will vote, there's going to be an element that uh, is going to shoot that bill down and that's what happened. And I don't think that was unexpected, but I, I I'm glad that they tried because I, the more light you can shine on this thing from any angle, uh, the better. Uh, as far as private contractors go, you know, I, I think that uh, that's a very good point because, um, you know, a lot of the things that the government used to do, or at least our government used to do, they don't do it anymore. They hire contractors, they contract with third parties, and they hold those people to the same standard that they would if they were active duty military. They have them sign non-disclosure agreements and uh, threaten to enforce them. So um, private contractors are going to be in possession of a lot of this stuff. I don't think that uh, that's where I think it would be uh, mm. for purposes of study uh, to gain knowledge about the aerodynamics and how the things work and what makes it go. And um, so, yeah, they're in the hands of private contractors. You know, um, those private companies have protections that, you know, you can't send what we call a FOIA request, a Freedom of Information Act request. You can't send that to Boeing mm. because even though they're contractors, they're not covered under that FOIA uh, law because they are private contractors. They're not, they're not uh, government actors. So... Yeah, it's going to be interesting to see how they sort that out and what kind um, of pushback we get from uh, we get from these contractors. Yeah, and I think we'll see that pushback, some of it publicly, and no doubt a lot of it behind the scenes that we won't get to see, but we might hear bits and pieces of too. Um, and a final question from Dave. Um, when Terry was last on the show, so back in February 2023, you said that there were three possibilities or three possible ways to view activity on abductions. A, they were doing this in cooperation with our governments on a shared project to address a shared issue. B, we had done a deal which allowed abductions in exchange for non-human tech. Or C, there's nothing we can do about it and the military just monitors it. Has your view on any of these possibilities changed post David Grush's comments? 
You know, maybe. Uh, I used to be a firm believer that um, ET was here and could do whatever they want um, without re repercussion. That, you know, there may have been an agreement with ET once upon a time, but, uh, um, you know, there are a lot of people that go missing in this world from from parks and from wilderness and people just uh, turn up missing. Uh, there's a, an author, David Politis, who mm. wrote a, a book series called Missing 411. And it talks about these incredible scenarios where people just vanish. And uh, I think ET might account for some of that. But yeah, I, I don't know. I used to think that they just do what they want to do because they can. Um, but now I'm wondering if maybe there is a quid pro quo, if there isn't an exchange, this for that, and maybe they're giving us something. Um, but I think they really want to keep that secret because I don't know what we're giving them. Maybe we might be giving them human beings. Who knows? Who knows? Who knows what the, what, what the exchange is? Terry, we're going to move on to another aspect of the, the conversation, which and we're going to keep going back and forward now. Um, on near-death experiences, you wrote a, a book along with George Verongos, or George yes. Verongos was the, the editor of the book, and it was called Freefall, an American Near-Death Experience. Um, now, you yourself, you've said you've never had a near-death experience, but um, this was about or through two other women. Do you want to just explain what that book was? Because I've got a question based on it or a few questions. Sure. Uh, during the pandemic and the lockdown, when uh, there wasn't a lot to do, um, I got, uh, you know, I got the usual flood of emails, you know, on and off. And uh, I'm kind of a data guy. I like to keep track of things and put things in a category. And uh, I had exactly six people contact me who were NDE experiencers and all of them wanted to know if I saw a connection between or even a correlation to or similarities with, I, I don't know, uh, the near-death experience and alien abduction. And to be honest, I really don't. Um, having written the book, I, I'm still not I'm still not certain. I, I, I kind of draw a line, a distinction between what I call paranormal, ontological, um, and what I call spiritual. Um, so I think there's there's a line there, mm. and uh, I'm not sure what category this goes into. Uh, but I had these six people contact me. Interesting demographics. Four of them were were physicians. Uh, three of them were women. And uh, I spoke with I spoke with everyone, um, and there were two physicians that had just incredibly great stories. Uh, one is named Virginia, and the other one is named Susie. Uh, and the character Susie is who I based the book on. Uh, this book was originally going to be written with their participation and their name on the book, um, but for personal reasons they chose not to do that so that, that was that was a big disappointment but uh but we had you know hours and hours and hours of conversation and that's where i got the information from and i'll say this having having no experience with the topic whatsoever um it makes me believe that that's i can't say that i'm convinced um, but I'm kind of in a way relieved. I mean, it's a place we're all going to be one day. And uh, I hope they're right. A place many of us might have been already and we're just back for another back for another go, potentially. Um, there's always, always that aspect of it. Um, so I've got quite a few questions based on the near-death experience work, and many of them tie back into the UFO topic in some way, straight, uh, shape or form. Uh, question from some of the YouTube users. So we've got some weird and wonderful usernames coming up here, Terry, but they are all real people. So from Doug Dastardly. Um, Hi, Andy. I would love to know two things. First, does Terry think 
uh, near-death experiences, lucid dreaming, and out-of-body experiences all come from a similar place? Yeah, I kind of do. I've never had an out-of-body experience, um, but I know people who claim to have had that experience. Uh, I'd love to experience that. Uh, it's never happened to me, but I think that's got to be similar to the out-of-body experience. Well, it is an out-of-body experience. These people all told me that they they left their physical body and uh, um, were just in spirit or whatever you want to call it. They weren't uh, connected to that physical entity anymore and, uh, and really could care less. Nobody was freaked out saying, oh, my God, I don't want to die. I got family. I got bills to pay, you know, this or that. Um, they all seem to think, well, this is my time. And, uh, and here we go. There's some, you know, there's some uh, Dr. Eben. Uh, oh, gosh. Eben Alexander uh, is the neurosurgeon, uh, Harvard neurosurgeon who had the near-death experience. Uh, and then there, there are a couple others, too, that are physicians. Uh, and I forget the names. Uh, but some very, very, uh, well, there's Dr. Raymond Moody, MD, PhD, who wrote Life After Life in 1975. Great book. Um, Dr. Bruce Grayson, Dr. Evan Alexander, Melvin Morris, Dr. Jeffrey Long, Dr. Pim. Van Lommel, uh, Sam Parnia, and the list goes on and on and on of these well-credentialed, obviously smart people, uh, all of them practicing well. I don't think that uh, even Alexander is practicing medicine right now, but uh, the bulk of whom you know, are working in, in, in medicine in, in their chosen field. Um, you know, they're very, very credible people. I know Leslie Kane's documentary on Netflix, Surviving Death, also starts with some very credentialed people and some of their stories. And I found some of those quite chilling as well. Again, people who are clinically dead and shouldn't have been able to come back from what they came back from, but they remember it. You know, no brain damage. Uh, yeah, fa really fascinating, but terrifying. Um, lucid dreaming I find very interesting as well because something I've had since I was a child is is a lot of really intense lucid dreams. I, I've said before, Terry, I, I don't I never like to go on about myself on the podcast, but I can have dreams where I'm very aware I'm dreaming. If you could come into the dream, you could speak to me and I could tell you I'm lying in my bed, I'm asleep, you know, my wife's next to me. If I'm walking um recently I was walking uh, in a in a street in New York. I love New York. I've only been a couple of times, but I love the place. But I, I will touch the walls of the buildings knowing I'm dreaming, but I can I can feel the wall. I can feel my feet. I literally wiggle my toes and my shoes and I can feel my socks. So all very strange, but I know I'm dreaming, but I've also got all the sensations as well, but mixed in with the strangeness of being in a dream. Would, would you characterize that as lucid dreaming? Do you have some control while you're oh, dreaming, yeah. you yeah, you know, I'll make yeah. it right here on Broadway and uh, uh, New York City. Yeah. And, and it comes with the frustration of knowing I'm dreaming and I'll have a memory of if I go down, for example, this street, this isn't where it should take me. So there's that confusion that you're in a dream, you know, this isn't the right way. And now I, I've ended up in my own house. Well, I was in New York five seconds ago. So that element of it still exists. Um which is really strange, but I'm I'm very aware I'm dreaming. Yeah, like I say, if you could plug into my head and coming and in, come into my dream, I'd be able to tell you I'm asleep. I'm dreaming. Hi, yep, welcome to my dream. Um, but I've had that since I was a kid. It's very odd. Um, yeah. Wow, that that mean that's that's a gift. I think that's a gift. I used to have some very scary dreams when I was a kid and it wasn't always nice. Um, but yeah. then you have the kind of nicer ones where you're on a holiday or, you know, somewhere warm or doing something fun. Um, so, yeah, the pros and cons. Um, I could always do the classic, close my eyes and I'd be in a different dream or I'd wake up. So that was always one aspect of it. But I suppose what I'm trying to say is I can understand how 
when we talk about the UFO phenomenon or things coming from somewhere else, not necessarily far away in terms of distance, but are our dreams or out-of-body experiences, near-death experiences, gateways to a different reality, a different dimension, and we can experience these. We just can't do it while we're conscious in this kind of meat sack we're in just now. Um, and that's where I see a lot of the subject tying into its tying into various different phenomena. Yes, I mean, yes, 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 and yes. Uh, uh, similar to that, Doug Dastardly does follow up. He says, when I was living in Edinburgh back in 2000, I'd had, I had a dream of being in a place I could only describe as completely dark. And I had a creepy dream about having to climb up inside of the walls blindly. Since then, I've had other dreams where I have known I am in different parts of that building and have a bit of an idea about its overall and bizarre layout. Having heard others talk about a place that only exists in their dreams that they return to, um, could this also be related to near-death experiences and out-of-body experiences? I've never had that one, but very strange. You know, I, I gotta think that there's a point where we transition from living to that other side. And I guess some people might just be wired or born to be closer to a near-death experience for whatever reason. Maybe it just bleeds over and, and they have these. Are any of your experiences uh, like heightened intuition, uh, prophecy of something that's going to happen happen um i've never personally had that in a dream um i get lots of tiny little synchronicity type things i'll be reading something on uh, yesterday i was reading um, an article on my laptop and i walk next door and the actor who i was reading about his name appeared on the tv and a credit but i mean literally as i walk through and saw it, and that's that that's just can be just coincidence but these things happen all the time i'll be talking to my wife and say do you know what do you remember the song such and such and it'll be the next one that comes on some obscure radio station i listened to from the 90s that you've not heard for about 15 or 20 years lots of stuff like that happens to me um i'll be I've got an overactive imagination and I'll be think I'm thinking all the time. And then a car license plate pulls up in front of you with, you know, like NDE in front of you when you're thinking of near death experiences, stuff like that. So yeah, it's um lots of stuff like that happens. I don't look I don't look too much into it other than maybe something's kind of pointing you that you're in the right direction with something or a good luck thing, you know, stuff like that. I love synchronicities. I feel when, when when I have an experience of synchronicity, it's it's always special to me. And it could be something trivial like a penny, but uh, yeah. you know, when it happens, I recognize it for what it is or what I think it is. It's either by random chance or it's synchronicity. Uh, I think it was Carl Jung, the uh, J-U-N-G mm. uh, psychologist, is, is really coined the phrase synchronicity. Um, and I, I, Einstein said synchronicity is uh, when God winks at you. Yeah. Think, have you heard that quote? Uh, no, but I can understand it. Uh, personally, I would replace God with something else. But yeah, the the I get what you're coming where you're coming from there. Um, something's just give it, giving a nod, you know. And I, I, I go with it. I just kind of smile and go, okay. Um, I don't love my life based on it, but yeah, it's, it's an interesting aspect. Um, still got a lot of questions to get through. Let's let's fire on here, Terry. Um, Peter asks, oh, well, actually, sorry, Peter said, I've just started reading Devil's Den the night before and I couldn't think of a question. So I hope uh, Peter has enjoyed the book because uh, he is working his way through that just now, Terry. Um, MJ Jumps says, maybe Mr. Lovelace could discuss the size of the craft that took him on the outside as opposed to how gigantic it was on the inside. Um, I think you mentioned that before, didn't you? I have. I have. I, you know, I'm not sure I reckon. I mean, I've talked about it before. I'm pretty sure I said, said described that in the book. Uh, but the difference was amazing. When, when I was asleep, they took us while we were asleep in the tent. So I opened my eyes and... I'm frozen. I'm paralyzed. I can't 
the only thing I can move is I can roll my eyes around and look, uh, but I can't, I can't move anything else. I'm frozen. And, uh, where am I going with this? All right. Um, I've got a follow-up if you've got some brain fog on that, just as a, a curiosity. Do you think there's any element of that where you weren't physically taken, but you were taken subconsciously, and that would allow for a craft to appear one way, but for you to then experience something completely different? You know, I'm talking about being in New York in a dream. Now, physically, I am lying in my bed and I am not in New York. However, subconsciously, you can be wherever you want to be because the mind takes you somewhere else. Do you think there's an element of this, you know, quote-unquote technology if you're taking someone's, you know, subconscious or consciousness on board, that that could allow that sort of manipulation? Or do you feel it was a truly physical abduction still? I think it was a physical abduction. I, I, I do. Again, I don't know who orchestrated it, but... Um, I, I really don't doubt that at all. Uh, and the, the difference in size, uh, I remember now, the difference in size was when I opened my eyes, I thought I was in some kind of giant warehouse or something mm. because the interior of this thing did not match the size of the outside. It was just enormous. And I don't know if they have a different set of physics or what, what <laughs> that's from. Uh, and I don't know if anybody else has had that experience, but it was definitely, definitely strange. Uh, and I don't think they took me to some other place. I think I was actually on the ship and the ship just the interior was bigger. And I think that's what it was. Do you think the ship stayed where it was? I think I was on the ship that looked much smaller from the outside than it looked at from the, than when looked at from inside. And uh, like I say, I don't think they took me to some other place. I think I was really experienced being in that craft and the fact that being inside of it, something's different about it. I mean, it's like twice, three times as big. So I don't know. Um, Pedro Laco asks, did you feel the beings were biological? I did. I did. Uh, well, wait a minute. I, I, I did as far as the, the entities that I saw. I saw a six-foot uh, tall entity that uh, was humanoid looking, uh, wasn't gray, uh, was kind of a pale pinkish color, but kind of had... Uh, Features like the gray, you know, just two nostrils, a slit for a mouth. Um, and then I saw like a uh, reptilian thing when I had the medical part of it. But the little guys, the uh, things that are referred to as the grays. Now, I get all kinds of, every time I say this, I get all kinds of male saying, oh, you don't know what you're talking about. They're this, they're that, they're the other thing. And I'd say, you know, humor me. I think there's probably a dozen different races and varieties of these things. But the things that I saw uh, that I would refer to as the grays all looked identical. And I just, they didn't seem like a living sentient thing like you and I are. They seem like uh, uh, like little robots, you know? some biological material and AI and nanotechnology and who knows what, but I think they're manufactured. Um, but that, that, that's my opinion. Yeah. What I'd like to do, Terry, is one of the listeners, Peter, sent in around 10 questions for you. Yeah. Um, I'd like to do those a little bit quick, more quick fire, but I was going to keep that for the people who pay for the podcast because Peter likes to send in a lot of questions and we have gone almost two hours now, Terry. Um, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to ask you, we'll just wrap up there and then we'll carry on maybe for 10 or 15 more minutes just for folks uh, a little a little extra for them who maybe pay for the podcast on YouTube, Patreon and all those other platforms. But before we do that, Terry, 
Can you let listeners know how they can pick up a copy of your book or books at this point now? And also, what do you want them to get from your books if they've picked it up and, uh, or they've read it or listened to it on audiobook? What do you want them to take away? Uh, well, my, my books about Devil's Den, I, the, I mean, the takeaway is that this was my experience. It really happened to me. Um, and I just... Um, hope that people can not dismiss that out of hand. And uh, there's a thing called the Dunning-Kruger effect where sometimes people have, they're inflexible with their, uh, their, uh, their, their thinking. They, can, they, they can't change their mind. They can't look at a different perspective. So I guess what I'm saying is look at it with an open mind and, and take from it what you will. And if you don't believe, that's okay too. Just I, I hope that, you find it entertaining. Uh, the third book, um, gosh, I, I was really, really impressed with NDEs because I knew absolutely nothing about them. And uh, so that might be something you might want to buy a book on. Maybe uh, I would recommend Dr. Raymond Moody's book, Life After Life. You know, read that and my gosh, you got a good idea of what's going on. And is there anything so, else you're working on or anything you would like to work on next? Um, I've got another project I'm working on, on a fourth book. Um, and my books are all on Amazon. Um, and uh, they're in uh, Kindle, paper. Uh, the third one is, has, a, has a hardbound copy. And... Uh, of course, they're, they're all. I made audio books for all of these, so I did. I did the voice. Uh, I read the books. The first two, the the third book, I uh, I did the intro, and then I hired a voice actor, uh, actress, because I needed a woman to play the character of Susie. Um, so, yeah, give those a listen. I, people seem to like them. I hope. If, if you read or, or listen to something, I just I just hope you enjoy it. Well, for everyone that's listened to the, the two parts for the, the hour and 57 minutes or so we've gone, thank you very much for listening. I hope you pick up a copy of those. People were, were really wonderful in their feedback to the first interview, and I'm sure they will be this time round as well. Terry, thanks to everyone who submitted questions. And for anyone who's signed up to the podcast from any of the, the paid platforms, you'd about hear another couple of questions submitted by Peter Earnshaw, um, who loves to submit a question or 10, um, that I'm going to get Terry just to take us through as a little added bonus. So Terry, I'll say thank you very much for your time. Thank you, Andy. It's, it's always a pleasure. to. It's a great conversation every time. Thank you. And I'll see everyone else in a few minutes on the other side. That is all for this week's show. Thank you very much for listening. Please remember to leave the podcast a review on your chosen platform. You can like, retweet and subscribe. That would all be very much appreciated. The shows are being uploaded onto YouTube as we speak more and more. You can sign up at patreon.com forward slash that UFO podcast to access the shows ad free as well. Please get in touch on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, that UFO podcast. Of course, on Twitter, it's at UFO, U-A-P-A-M. And again, folks, as always, keep looking up. You never know what you might see. It wasn't a Tic Tac and not quite a saucer, more like a hubcap designed by Chaucer, a little Baroque and quite steampunk, like Alice was playing bass for the Parliament of Folk. The little fucker hovered right outside of my window, and when I shoved out the screen, he made it an issue. I don't think he expected me to see his ass, but I'd had some champagne and smoked a little red. Meditated game of state full on meta. I can't imagine how it could have been any better. I got to the top of the stairs and there he was. I'm like, you awake? I was about to abduct you, cuz. nearly kissed myself and I climbed out the window after the elf and I woke up in my bed and there was something on my head and everything was weird and everything was red and I called up my boys, they thought this was noise, they thought it was a dream, they thought it was my toys, they thought it was my problems and they think I should seek therapy and I don't know what it is because it doesn't really scare me.